You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hi everybody, and welcome back to the Higher Ideas Podcast. Well, here we are at the end of the introductory sort of Occupy-related content section of the podcast. There's been topics that were not Occupy-related here and there, but overall the vibe of what I've been talking about has been very political and very sort of activist protester-related. And I've saved the best for last, and I have to admit to you that I've kind of held out on you. In uh, episode number two, where I told you the overall story of my Occupy experience, I left one very important tidbit out. And as a final touch, I'm going to reveal that now. See, as I mentioned in that podcast, I had never done any sort of activism. I had never participated in any sort of movement or protest or any sort of community type of uprising thing like that. And I was really sort of afraid to do it. Part of me didn't want to do it. As I said in that second episode, I was compelled to do it. There's a force behind me pushing me, and I had to find a way to make it happen or it would crush me. And being the somewhat interesting, quirky guy that I am, I found my own way. And that was to paint my face. So the entire time that I was at Occupy in my town, I had the Canadian maple leaf painted across my face in black. And I'll be putting up some images on the video version of this episode. If you want to check it out, I'll be showing them right about now. It turned into quite a dramatic statement. At first, like most things I do, I sort of just did it by instinct. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't ponder the symbolism of it. It just felt right to paint a maple leaf on my face in black to try and make myself a little more anonymous. I guess just in case I regretted it or just in case... There was a list being compiled, I don't know. But for whatever reason, I painted my face, and I went every single day in this disguise. And something really interesting happened that I really didn't expect. Actually, a lot of interesting things came of that that I didn't expect. But the most striking of which is that it took me out of myself. When I took on this other personality of this masked person, I was able to take myself out of my ego, out of doing this for me and being able to talk about, oh, I've got this issue and that issue, and listen to my issues, like everyone there basically was doing. I felt like when I spoke, I was speaking through that leaf. I was speaking through the face of an angry country. The black leaf, in the end, turned into a symbol of dissatisfaction with my country. And because I was trying to stay anonymous, as I mentioned, I couldn't talk about my issues. So it forced me, first of all, to listen to other people's issues, and secondly, to speak about issues that cover everyone, that don't narrow anything down to who I am. And that was a really interesting experience. Not to mention the fact that all of us have certain shortcomings about ourselves that we hold on to, that we can easily overcome by just letting them go. For me, It was reluctance to accept that what I have to say is not crazy and that people might be interested in hearing it and might be excited to hear it. I had this sort of uh, self-hating voice in my head that would say, just keep it to yourself, nobody cares, just shut up, you know, everyone already knows, just you don't need to talk. And this kept me quiet pretty much my whole life, except when I was a kid. I was a lot freer as a kid, as we all are. But this freed me from that, because I wasn't me. I was this character. I had a pseudonym. I was completely unknown to anyone as myself. So I was able to build myself as a brand new person, as the person I would like to be. And so I became a little attached to this character. I was glad to put this face on and go to the camp every day and see what other amazing thing I would accomplish by being outside myself. Kind of felt like being a superhero, not to be too grandiose. And it really made me appreciate the concept of war paint. When native tribes would go to war, they would paint their face. And I guess that's sort of putting their game face on. That was putting their warrior's mask on. 
I felt the same way when I would be painting this every morning in the mirror. I had to brush it and I got pretty quick at doing it. But while I was doing it, I, I could feel myself getting psyched up for the day. It was really a sort of meditative experience to do it. Another really interesting uh, quirk of going to the camp in this way was that it made everyone instantly doubt me. And you would think that's a bad thing, right? Why would you look like a fool and have everybody instantly think you're not to be listened to or some kind of kook, right? You would think with such a face, people wouldn't take you seriously. And that turned out to be a great thing because I started to see very quickly, one by one, anyone who listens to me speak or anyone who spoke to me directly ended up just totally ignoring the face. They spoke to me as a human being. I could see it in their eyes when they spoke to me. They weren't looking at the face wondering, what's up with the face? They were just speaking to me as a human being. They had respect because they knew where I was coming from. I was challenged to speak through the face, to speak past the face. It made me uh, have to shine my inner self even brighter to overcome it. So it was a great obstacle in the end. It was a great barrier to overcome because it made me reach even higher and harder to, to impress or to do the right thing or to come from the right place within me. Not a place of showmanship or not a place of ego, not a place of uh, instability. It made me watch my steps carefully and make sure that I acted in the best spirit of the movement and the best ideals of the cause and represent the group, not represent myself. And as I said in the second episode, I eventually felt like I gathered quite a lot of respect from people in the camp. And this is all despite this face, this ridiculous face that I felt ridiculous doing in the first place, but in the end, so glad I did it. So that's me. That's the first look you get at me. But it's not really me. It's the me that I was on that camp. And the person that was born through that experience, this figure that even today isn't even me, I can't recapture that without putting that face on. There's still a piece of that that's left in me. It left an experience, a strength, uh, a sort of echo inside me that still reverberates. So part of who is speaking to you through all of this is that person. Now since then, I've become a lot less concerned with hiding who I am. I went through great pains to be anonymous during this whole experience. I had set up some email accounts anonymously through browsers that hide your IP and redirect it throughout the world. Um, I saw how difficult it is to even use the internet truly anonymously anymore. It's getting really Orwellian out there. You are tracked pretty much everywhere now. And the options for not being tracked and circumventing that tracking is getting smaller and smaller things like the Tor browser. If you ever want to browse the internet anonymously, look up Tor, T-O-R. It's a project that redirects your traffic through a network of other users and masks where you're coming from. But see, the thing is, it's a technology that relies on everyone using it. So being that not a lot of people use it, it's slow. And things like Flash are blocked. It's not very great for browsing the internet just randomly. But for, for many things like emailing or using forums or looking up information, it's great if you want to stay anonymous. But then even when I was doing that, I would find that a lot of the more popular free email services specifically blocked this tool. Which makes you wonder just what is the motivation behind all that? Are you trying to eliminate anonymity on the internet? That's one of the great strengths of the internet, and it's trickling away. Not only that, but traveling throughout the city, trying to get to the camp through public transportation, through cars, I became very aware of cameras, cameras everywhere. When you're just going about your day minding your business, uh, it's very easy to not notice this, but increasingly there are cameras everywhere and you are easily tracked back to where you came from. It was very, very, uh, it, it, was a, it gave you a very bad feeling. I wasn't doing anything wrong, I was just going to... Uh, the Occupy camp, which wasn't a crime, and it was for the good of society. It was a good and noble act, and yet I had to feel like a criminal doing it. I had to feel watched and tracked and paranoid about this. 
And when you start seeing that this kind of stuff was added around 2008, right around the time these kinds of protests would come around, it really made you wonder, are they adding these cameras to stop terrorism? Or are they adding these cameras to stop movements? But it didn't stop me. And in the end, I'm sure they know exactly who I am if they wanted to. The government, whoever, intelligence. I'm sure they have many tools to figure out who you are, even with a painted face. And uh, there were quite a lot of cameras taking pictures of me, so... <laughs> I doubt it did much, but it gave me a sense of security that I could speak more honestly and more fearlessly. And I also got a feeling of how unglamorous a superhero life might be, because uh, I would actually sneak off the camp without my makeup in order to just disappear. I would wait for the sunset and wait for people to be distracted at the end of the day, and I would sneak into the porta potties we had and had to wipe all of this paint off my face with sometimes just a rough hand napkin and some water in a cup, just trying to get all of this thick makeup off so I could sneak off the camp and go through the transit system without this paint on my face. I'd sort of do a costume change and disappear. And this was really funny because I remember one time sitting there in that toilet, hearing people in the next stalls pooing and farting and through all sorts of smells and sounds, I had the cell phone up to my face trying to make a light so I could see how well I was cleaning my makeup off. And I was using this cup of water and toilet paper to wipe off my face, and in my head I thought, well, this is it. This is the life of a hero, of a superhero. <laughs> oh, it was, it was full of very interesting moments like this, and I met a lot of interesting people. So that's it. Another little part of me for you to know. And even though it's a part that's now in my past, there's still a part of it in me, as I said. And... This person, whoever I became during that one month on the camp, is still very much part of why I'm here. Because as I explained in that episode, that experience is where I learned that people appreciate what I have to say when I was fearless enough to finally say it. And it's where I learned just how my speech can take even me away um, when I let my passions rise and, and flow and how it takes everyone with me. There were times where I spoke up in the group uh, as this person and I would lose myself in whatever I was saying. I was not even aware really of what I was saying. It was just coming. And my hands even would tingle sometimes and I would feel in my head, oh my god, I'm going to pass out, S slow down, stop. But I would just keep going and close my eyes and finish my thoughts and then I would stop and breathe and look around and people would just be smiling and and there would be a small moment of silence, and then people would just cheer. And it seemed to me like they would do it a lot harder and louder than they did with other people. So it was exhilarating. It was very satisfying to know that by being this selfless person that I was being on the camp, this character that is beyond any personality and was only speaking as a sort of channel for the movement, to see what could happen, how we could move people, and the excitement that it could bring. As I said in the beginning of this podcast, I really wish I could still have that energy. It was something to do with speaking in front of a group, I think, or just borrowing the energies of that camp, I don't know. But I haven't been able to capture it so far on this podcast, I think. Except maybe in the one about coincidence. I was a little excited there, but it still wasn't as heated and, 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 and alive. You know what? It just hit me. It just hit me. I was Hanuman. As I said in the coincidence overload episode, I was in that moment, in that experience, embodying the spirit of the lesson of Hanuman. And the reason that coincidence story excited me so much, I encourage you to listen to it, the reason I got so excited was because when I spoke to that guy, I was that guy again. I was that character again. I was speaking from a deeper place that wasn't me, that was just coming from a genuine want to help, a genuine selfless want to help. And that's when amazing things happen. The story of Hanuman, this concept of, of being this way, is more and more resonating with me right now. The universe really does do amazing things when you just completely devote yourself to helping. It's that power, that power that comes from not being selfish, the power that comes from complete, genuine devotion to help the people around you. 
You would think it's a weakening, draining thing, but as I felt in that coincidence experience and on that camp, it's empowering, it's invigorating, it's energizing, it's amazing. That's what it is. I have to find a way to hold on to that kind of mentality. It really accomplishes great things. As when I spoke through that face, I really miss it. Now, I think that's everything when it comes to that face. And I have to really thank my friend who helped me as much as possible to travel anonymously to and from this camp and took very good care of me by bringing me food and soup and hot drinks on these cold, cold days. And also I have to thank everyone else on that camp who gave me a chance even with this ridiculous face. If any of you guys happen to be listening to this, well here I am still trying to continue what I started there. And I hope you guys are too. Ah, well, that's it, the final piece of the puzzle. The final piece of my Occupy saga. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. I hope you are still following this podcast, and I hope you're sharing it with others. Till next time.